I'd like to uh, reconvene our open session and ask you to stand for the pledge, please. Ready to begin? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a um, report of closed session. In closed session, by a vote of 5 to 0, the board took action to appoint Dale Miller as a high school assistant principal effective July 29, 2019. I have a motion to adopt our agenda, please. Second. Thank you. Carol, thank you. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda? No. All in favor of the agenda as presented? Aye. 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 Here's my vote. Uh, recognition. We have a number of recognitions tonight, and we begin with our elementary spelling bee. So, Mr. Judge. Good evening, everyone, board members, community. Uh, annually, the fifth graders have a spelling bee for the elementary school, and uh, this is Zoe Tran, and she was the El Moro spelling bee champion, and then she was the runner-up in the El and the excuse me, Laguna Beach Unified School District final uh, spelling bee. So we're very proud of Zoe, and we want to say congratulations. Thank you. This is Elise Chen. She is the uh, she's the winner of the TW El Moro Spelling Bee. So it was it was an amazing competition. It, it got down to the final two. And I think they went back and forth at least through about 20, 25 words. Just I mean it was it was amazing. But I mean the, most of the kids that were still waiting were like, can they just lose and get the <laughs> ice Just give them both the, 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 the prize. But they they were it, it was it was great to see just the competitive spirit. Amazing spelling, but it's, it's, it was a very cool experience to, to witness, and I'm sure it was a great part. So congratulations, at least we're very proud of you. Um, there's a parent back there, one of them. Do you want to come up here and take a picture? You, yeah, yeah, you yeah, want to come up and take a picture? Right? Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, you guys stand there. TV, so come up here. We've got some children. You're welcome. Uh, can I get you guys to stand in front of the podium? So, Elise is from here. So, this is your. There you go. I'll get you guys to stand on either side of the <laughs> Thank you for coming and letting us congratulate you. We have um, some teams from Destination Imagination. Are the principals to mm -hmm. this as well? Okay. So Mike there. So Mike. All right. I'll just continue. Pull up the uh, email for you. All right. So we have two teams from Top of the World that, that competed in Destination Imagination. So if I can have the banana, 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 uh, peach neighbors, <laughs> consisting of Emma Berg, Piper Clausen, Colin Gregg, Kais Kaiser and Justin Yi, please make your way to the front here. They uh, played second place in the, at the regional tournament at, at Thurston and received an invitation to states, but decided to not take their, their talents to. Uh, <laughs> where was that? The, the state? <laughs> Clo Beautiful Clovis. Shocking. They chose not to go to the <laughs> Next year. And then we also like to uh, recognize our team, the Raging Buffaloes. So if Aiden Hunthausen, Oliver Griffin, Samuel Wong, and Douglas Nottage can please make their way up as well. Raging Buffalo. Well, so I actually forgot about my son, believe it or not. <laughs> 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 I'm not have also, uh, yeah, he's at home. Well, <laughs> <laughs> still raging. Yeah. <laughs> uh, finished first at regionals, and then yeah. their finals at, uh, they're still waiting for the, the finals at They did go to states and compete at states as well. So, amazing, amazing job. All you know, you got a lot out of the experience, and we appreciate you representing Top of the World so well. 
And we have some certificates for you. So. Emma is not here. Piper is here. Mr. Greg. So another round of applause for our guests. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you to the parents who help our students participate in the destination imagination. I know it takes a lot of coordination and time. Uh, we, next up we have LBUSD Employees of the Year and Thank you. Um, so we wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge our employees of the year. Unfortunately, not everyone who were able to join us tonight. Uh, but we would like to acknowledge Steve, Steve Sogo from Laguna Beach High School for earning the distinction of Teacher of the Year. And we would also like to rec uh, recognize Nikki Romano from TOW for earning the distinction of Classified Employee of the Year. point out that Nikki has class tonight and that's why she's not able to attend. She's actually enhancing her skills in the library media area and that's just one example of the reasons why she was selected for employee of the year. So we just wanted to acknowledge both of them. Thank you. We have um, some retirees for our district this year that we are recognizing. And we are Thank you, President Vickers. If you would help uh, join me, we're going to go by school for our retiree recognitions. But first, I just wanted to uh, mentioned that I'm honored to help recognize and congratulate our staff, and it's so great to see so many of them here tonight who have retired or will be retiring this year. Um, we're privileged to recognize these dedicated members of our family, and we really want to, to acknowledge them for their dedication um, to the organization and to the students that um, they've served here in the district. So we're really fortunate um, to have them and uh, to be able to acknowledge them and recognize them for their service tonight and to wish them the best as they move into the next chapter of their lives, which is, I'm sure, to be very exciting. Um, so first we're going to start at TOW, so I'm going to have Mike Conley come up. And um, first we're going to recognize um, Terrell Campbell. <laughs> so I've had the pleasure of, of working with Tara these past five years. She has spent 26 years on uh, TOW's campus, enriching the lives of countless students. Um, you, you go into her classroom and you can just you can sense her passion immediately. She cares so deeply about the students' well-being, but also strives to be the best possible uh, educator and instructor, and has continually grown and really taken on any new learning and apply it back to her classroom. Um, it's just, yeah, she's been the rock in the fifth grade team. I know her team will miss her dearly next year. Um, but we just, we appreciate your passion for Talk the World, for all you've done for the, for the students. And uh, we really, again, thank you so much and we wish nothing but the best. Yeah. Thank you. Also, wants to express our appreciation for your years of this. She showed up to every open house. And you always acknowledge it. I did. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I'm disappointed because I thought it was 27 years. Oh, well, don't check with HR. Maybe one more year, you'll get 27. I just want to thank you for the opportunity to show up to such a lovely place for 27 years. And the best part was greeting those sweet students every day. I remember when I couldn't stand the thought of summer coming, because what in the world was I going to do without my students? And I adjusted eventually. And then I would hear about people retiring. I thought, I'm never retiring. That just sounds awful to me. But somehow, <laughs> I, I settled in with the idea, and I think I'm going to handle it beautifully. <laughs> thank you so much for the opportunity to do this, because it, it's something I will treasure my whole life. Thank you. Next, we have Patty Raven. Uh, what to say about oh, no. <laughs> uh, I've, I've had I've had some good times in the last five years getting to know you, and just it's again similar. You have you have you have quite a passion. Um, and extends, you know, outside the walls of, of your of your classroom. But you can tell that you truly love what you do, 
and you really put the students' needs first, and you put you put so much time and effort into making sure that they are getting everything that they need. And like I said, you've you're, you're you've been you've kind of found your you found your, your your yourself in third grade again this year. It, it just you, you connect so well with the students at that age, and you just like I said, they they, they love being in class with you. Um, so it's truly a blessing. Wish you nothing but the best. Like, I, I got 22 years at top of the world. Was that actually? <laughs> 23. 23. So yeah, really, it's close. But again, it's, that has been there again. Countless students that you that you supported and, and made a difference in their lives, and we truly appreciate that. And you enjoy time with yeah. your husband and your, and your your children. But thank you so much for all you've done, and thank you're part of the team. It'll be a family. Every single open house, back to school night. We appreciate your support. Um, I wanted to thank the board, of course, and I have been so lucky to work with such a professional administration and uh, professional colleagues. It's like no other, seriously. So, um, and of course, the kids are a bonus. So, and their parents, right? <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Thank you.
experiences uh, and stories that she is able to share and connect with each and every person on our campus, parents, students, staff alike. It really makes a difference. Each day, I would learn personally something new about Nancy, like didn't know about the Alaska pipeline. She'll have to fill you that in later. Uh, but she's just amazing, and she brings such a, a, a uniqueness to our campus with her thoughts and her ideas and her honesty. Um, and it just makes such a huge difference. The kids will really miss you. This is how I knew that it was maybe time for Nancy, uh, that she was going to... Well, yeah. <laughs> About mid-January, I see her walking around the office midday with just her purse, like, <laughs> just walking around. Like, Nancy, it's not even close to leaving. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Symbolically, she was trying to let me know. So, Jenny, it's time for me to go. So, uh, I'm so sorry that you'll be leaving us, but I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Well, right. oh, well, well. Well.
in the Orange County's High School for the Arts, and then has been with LBUSD since 2005. Um, everything Bob does is uh, the actions he takes, the decisions he makes, um, they're done with the students' best interest in mind. Now students and parents might not always agree with that being what's the best interest of students, but he does it always for the right reasons and to help students maximize their potential and growth. And it's been an honor to work with him for the last couple years too, and I appreciate all you've done for the school community. Thank you for all you've given me these district You're welcome. <laughs> you have a speech? <laughs> yeah, other than to say, um, I came in here thinking I knew everything about education, and I'm leaving a better man because the kids and the parents and the people I work with. I'm going to miss you a lot. But it's my time to go fly fishing and hang out with my wife. <laughs> so thank you all, and really good luck as I send pictures back to you. <laughs> so, so we have um, a special message. Um, Odile Dewar was an able speaker tonight, um, but she did uh, leave us a message, and we still want to offer Honor her and we'll play that message for everyone. Good evening. I'm so sorry I cannot be with you here tonight, but I would like to say one. Okay. You guys, Good evening. I'm so sorry I cannot be with you here tonight, but I would like to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to give me such wonderful adventures in teaching for the last 30 years of my life. Thanks to everybody at Laguna Beach Unified School District. Thank you to everyone at Laguna Beach High School, the staff, the administration, my colleagues, and especially mi amigos, mi familia the language teachers who are my life. Senor Gonzalez, Senor Garvey, Senorita Johnson, Carita Garcia, Amy, Randy, merci. Thank you to Steve Bogashevich, who has been more than supportive during those very difficult times. Thank you to Rod Ortiz and Johnny McKnight, who both retired a few years ago. Rod brought me into the learning equation. It's very inspiring to me. Again, merci. Spasibo bolshoye. Gracias. Sheshe. But most of all, thank you to this extraordinary community and my students who have inspired me day after day and brought so much joy into my career, in my profession. And now I would like to bring a message, to convey a message to this assembly tonight. And the message is about teaching. Teaching is not just about teaching a subject. Yes, it's important to know, like for instance in language acquisition, to learn new things to be able to be global citizens. But what's more important in teaching is individuals. We teach individuals first. And we have this great gift and duty as teachers in our hands to enlighten, inspire, and care for those young minds day after day and bring them into the discovery of their life. So, we always have to remember when we teach that we're teaching human beings and we have to be human. Because this is our mission. Teaching is more than just a profession. It's a mission we're being called upon. And those vulnerable, fragile, and beautiful minds we can direct and guide are here to be set step after step into the canvas of their future to paint with their own colors, their own shapes, their own worlds and imagination, their dreams, and to fulfill their full potential. That's what being a teacher is. One day at a time, one minute at a time, one second at a time. And even when we're frustrated 
And even when we're tired, because teaching is very tiring, we always have to remember that teaching is the epitome of the human being experienced. So kids are just like plants. They, some of them bloom a little faster, and some of them bloom a little longer. But at the end, with the right kind of nutrition, shade or sunshine, and a lot of love, they will bloom. And the best reward for a teacher is when this bloom and these fishes come together, and during the summer time, they come back to you and say that you have been a great part of their life, and you made a difference in their life. So let's remember this, this passionate job, this passionate profession that brings us together for the greater good of this universe. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you, Mrs. Thank, Thank you for putting that together. Uh, we need to go back to DI because we have a high school team. Okay. I'd like to recognize the brilliant Boom Bam Bananas. Uh, who uh, and visiting us tonight are Miles Real, Miles Real, Joe Hoanessian, and Jared Moy. Welcome, gentlemen. Took, their team took first place in regional, second place in state, and also decided to forego nationals because of the location, I believe. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And we have uh, School Power Teacher Grants. Sarah Duran, you're presenting these. And Chris Clark. Grants that we are giving away this year for the 2019 2020 
school year. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Duran, our Executive Director for School Power, to help present the certificates to our award winners, or grant winners. <laughs> Can I get you guys to step in front of the podium? Yeah. You and I'm going to bring up Steve. Steve Snowmillan is our incoming endowment president, and another member of the endowment was here with us tonight. I don't think we have any other endowments for a speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You can keep this. <laughs> Catch it quick. All right. Um, so teachers, if you are here and you hear your name, come on up and we'll take a quick photo right here um, with Chris and we'll keep moving this forward. <laughs> All right, so our first, um, this is a total grant, this is actually three grants combined into one for STEAM lab materials, including kind first watches and also replicas and alternative energy lab kits. Um, I'll bring up Jackie Cohn and Kathy. Congratulations. Exactly. Congratulations. Congratulations. For the outdoor extension of the STEAM classroom, uh, Kathleen, stay on. <laughs> <laughs>
organization and planning skills intervention program for Amanda Vanderveen at Thurston Dove. <laughs> is find a better replacement, and I have done that uh, in spades with Steve Samuel, so I'm very uh, happy to be turning over the reins to him, and, you know, he'll do a great job for you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all our teachers and recipients that came to get recognized for your future grants, but I also want to comment, and I know that Amber Perry would also notice that this year, this, the endowment board spends a lot of time going over these, asking a lot of questions, encouraging teachers to apply for more, even asking, are you sure this is all you need? You asked for this many, but maybe you need more. So it's, it's a really thoughtful process, and they spend a long time making their selections and, and encouraging that support for our teachers to have something extra. That well, and you can see they're excited to get that. So thank you, Chris, and the, and the board, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take a short break so that you teachers can leave and thank you.
Um, TOW just finished their cast testing last week and are now preparing for their open house tomorrow night. Uh, this week at LBHS is cast testing for juniors. Last week, ASB got in touch with Active Socks and held a fundraiser. For every $7 pair of socks sold at lunch, $2 would go back to RASB. Our drama productions class just finished their run at Little Shop of Horrors, uh, held in the black box at Thurston, and had a great turnout with a filled audience every night. Um, our College and Career Center held a Common App Information Session last Thursday for juniors and their parents, and they covered the basics of college applications, especially through the Common App. For break, Breaker Athletics, um, they wrapped up last week in the state finals in track and field. We'd like to congratulate our senior, Sebastian Fisher, who placed seventh in the 1500 meter race. With almost 4,000 schools in California, Sebastian's placement put him in the top 1% of distance runners in California. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Lilitha, Beth? Hi. Uh, Lilitha, they're all gone now, but we'd like to thank our retirees <laughs> for their years of service and dedication. And good wishes in their next venture. We're going to miss them greatly. Um, we completed our third round of bargaining negotiations. We appreciate everyone's time and effort they put into coming together on behalf of the teachers and students. Thank you. CSA and Margaret. Yes, um, first of all, CSA would like to congratulate the teachers. Um, and we did have one uh, CSA member who retired, but she wasn't here today. Um, for the collaboration that we have between our classified staff and our teachers, and we will miss those that are leaving. And of course, Mr. Villinger, who uh, serves on our negotiation team also, and we will greatly miss him as our input. Uh, with that, um, CSEA had their last uh, negotiation meeting of the year, yay. And it was very good, very positive. We uh, submitted a joint communication that has gone out to uh, all members, but we, uh, through CSEA, have to go through a 610 policy, which is part of our association uh, bylaws and rules where our um, larger organization reviews the contract. Then we will be voting on June 5th at all sites, and that will be done for all of our CSEA Chapter 131 members. And then on June 12th, we will ratify our contract. I'd also like to thank the board and administration. Um, Nikki Romano, whose name was mentioned earlier as our classified employee of the year. Elizabeth Phillips, who's the health clerk at Thurston, and myself, uh, attended the Governor's uh, May Revision Workshop with uh, administration. We welcome that opportunity to be invited to go along and understand what is actually coming through school services on the budget so that we clearly have an understanding of where the monies and where allocations are going to meet the needs of schools. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Board members, anything that you uh, represent the board up? The um, Fiscal Management Committee has not met, but I know that we're on, uh, on schedule for funding. So good job, Jeff. Um, I attended the Orange County School Board Association um, as speaker at the Orange County Department of Education last week on the Governor's May Revision. Do you have that? Uh, Kevin Gordon spoke. It was interesting. Spoke about the budget. It's all school board members. Gloria? Uh, no reports, thank you. I just want to thank um, both the members of the CSEA negotiation team as well as um, the members of the district negotiations team that really worked collaboratively using um, interest-based bargaining principles to come to a, a collaborative agreement. Um, and thank you, Margaret, for your leadership of, of the CSEA team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few things. We're closing up the school year. Um, we are preparing summer professional development for teachers and classified, and we are in the midst of our annual residency process and following up with our families. So thank you for your support. Thank you. And we have uh, next is our consent calendar. Um, are there any items that we would like to pull? And I'd just like a motion, please, for items on the consent calendar A through M. Second. Thank you. Is there any public comment on any of the items on the consent calendar? Any more discussion? Um, three questions. Then all in favor as presented? Aye. Opposed? Carries by vote. Our next item is our, we have one information item tonight. That's item 13, report on weighted grades slash credit at Laguna Beach High School. Dr. Nepo. 
for the college and career indicator on the dashboard. In addition, we put all of our classes up in the management portal. Formerly UC doorways, all of our courses get approved in the UC system. It's the UCOP um, Office of the President system. An additional question came up asking about the course approval process. So once you as a board approve the course of study, the teacher leaders and the assistant principal either revise or build courses in that management portal, and then the University of California approves it or sends it back to the school with revisions. And once it's approved, it's posted on the UC doorways or the management portal website. An additional question that was posed from the board is in what ways has enrollment changed since that 2016 decision? So let's go, we picked a few courses out. Here's honest, uh, English Honors 10. Blue is 9 honors, red is 10 honors. So one way to look at it is 15, 16. They were, those were weighted courses. 16, 17 through 18, 19, it became, those became unweighted courses. The percent talks about the percent of students that opted to go into the honors class. So let's break this down. So 36% of English 9 students opted for honors, whereas 64% didn't. So we, we showed you the percentages of students that selected to take the honors course. So you'll see that there was no change in enrollment for English honors. In fact, English 10 had an increase. Honors Spanish, you'll see that the first year, Honors Spanish 2 declined, the first year only. But we have increased enrollment, even though the courses were weighted in the out years. Algebra 2 honors, I want to spend a little bit of time and talk about this because it's not just about enrollment. We have um, kind of the cross section of the math pathway in here. So I think it's important that we talk this through. So the first column in 15 16, we had 9th and 10th graders in Algebra 2 honors. 16 17, we had 10th and 11th graders. 17 18, we only had 11th graders. Sort of our anomaly year, we are missing students in the pathway. However, in 1819, we have our advanced middle school students. We have 9th, 10th, and 11th grade. So students that accelerated in the math pathway, we have multiple students in the grade. We've done an analysis, and we believe that even though this shows the evolution of the math pathway, we wanted to show you what enrollment looks like, but we've looked at our, our middle school cohorts, and we have a lot of middle school students sitting in that accelerated pathway, so we believe that 1819 demonstrates what the cohorts will look like in the out years because we have so many students in the middle school pathways. Another question came for scholarships. So I want to break this down into two different types of scholarships. First, National Merit Scholarships. You don't have to do anything to get this award. You just qualify by taking the PSAT and being enrolled in high school. We've had a few students every year get this nomination. However, and I think it's important that we also talk about marriage scholarships by school. So I reached out to UCLA, USC, and Stanford and told them we unweighted. So what would the impact be on merit scholarships with, with weighted GPAs. So even though every college weights differently, we weight based on the UC system, we are competitive in these scholarships. So UC, UCLA said they don't make decisions based on GPA. SC said that they recalculate based on their GPAs. And Stanford said that they do not give merit scholarships. They all though said that the school profile is key. When a student submits this, their transcript on the Common App, the school profile tells the university and college everything that they need to know. It is about a student's strength of schedule. So, so when we have 2,800 schools and about 150 are considered highly selective, which means that they they admit less than 50% of their attendance rate, we know that about 150 to 200 are highly selective. 
they all recalculate with the exception, according to the Mies Pope, to five or six of them. Five or six of those, G of those schools take the school's GPA that's weighted. All of the other ones, according to Denise Pope and Julia Scott Haynes, the strength of schedule tells the story of the student's GPA. According to Kirk Brennan, he's the director of admissions. He was wonderful and went back not 20 minutes after I wrote him. This is what he said. An absence of waiting doesn't hurt your students at all in our process. We don't pay attention to the GPA provided by the high school. We recalculate our own GPA, but even then, it's just a number. In general, more A's is better, but we'll admit students that we think will engage most effectively. He goes on to say that on average, most USC students that are admitted have about, on average, five B's, and they think it makes for a better community. So we appreciate your support. With your support, we'll continue to align to the UC system in preparation for all of our students. What questions do you have? And now we have our public comment on the, we have the cards submitted on this item. This, uh, this is an information item again for us tonight, but we have uh, Amy Kramer. Good evening, I'm Amy Kramer. Uh, thank you so much for providing the additional information. We definitely appreciate it. Um, I just want to start out by saying, in light of the recent admission scandals <laughs> and USC's big role in that, um, not to mention the newly devised adversity scoring on the SAT, which is, uh, from what I understand, going to be hidden, and will, but will only be uh, visible to the school that's looking at it, um, and the fact that an increasing number of colleges are making test scores an option for admission, I think that now, more than ever, GPA does matter. Um, I think it's worthy to uh, ensure that our honors courses are UC approved. I um, still believe, though, that ninth grade courses can be uh, included in um, that grade rating. There are opportunities at Tustin Unified. There are four high schools that offer English one honors where ninth graders are allowed to take this. Now, you're saying, well, UC doesn't care. Well, Cal State University of Slow cares, and other private colleges care. So why aren't we offering this to our students in ninth grade so that they can take advantage of this type of waiting? Um, I'm not, I, I understand that you're trying to, to manage this and you're trying to take care of all of these classes, but I still don't understand why it's all so piecemeal. It's Quite frankly, it's very confusing, it's very chaotic, and it's slightly punitive to all of the kids that have taken these honors courses and they haven't received the reward. Well, fine, they're going to receive the reward like the reward in like two years from now, but it's still, it's, I, I don't understand why you didn't leave everything in place and, and fix the things as you went along. You knew that there were problems already with honors courses, and, um, and then you added in a bunch of APs, which I guess is great. So anyway, um, I, I think that, and also as far as scholarship goes, everybody knows that UC and schools like Stanford and NYU are completely need-based. They, they, don't, they don't offer anything for merit. They, people go there, they, they have so many people applying, they don't have to worry about offering money to the top GPA earners um, or the top test earners. They, they're completely need-based, so I'm kind of confused about that. So hopefully you guys will make this an action item and we can vote on this and return to our um, existing policy while all of this stuff is cleared up and that ninth graders are offered an honor uh, waiting. Thanks. Emily Judd. Good evening. My name is Emily Judd. I submitted a statement urging the board to retroactively reinstate honors course grade waiting at the April board meeting. At this time, I would like to remind the board that it is not just setting policy. The decision that it makes with respect to grade weighting has concrete results that affect our students, most particularly our current juniors, who are the first students to suffer from the consequences of the removal of honors course grade weighting. My 11th grade honors student is one of many LBUSD juniors that are faced with the negative consequences of the removal of honors course grade weighting. 
My job as her parent is to keep every door possible open to her. It is then for her to decide which door to walk through. My daughter chose to take, for example, Honors English 9 and 10 and Spanish, Spanish Honors 2 and 4. She worked hard to achieve A's in those Honors courses, and she should re receive the reward of Honors course grade weighting so that her GPA is on par with Honors students from competing school districts. Please do not put her and other Laguna Beach Honors students at a disadvantage. With respect to my son, who is an incoming freshman, I simply do not understand a board policy that removes grade weighting and fails to reward his decision to take accelerated geometry rather than regular geometry. Most LBUSD honor students will not attend a UC. Each student deserves the right to fairly compete for spots at the university of their choosing. Let's make policies and decisions that keep doors open to our students. That is my job as a parent and your job as our school board. Thank you. Ella Judd. Hello. My name is Ella Judd and I am a junior at Laguna Beach High School. I am here today to discuss and question why LBHS has decided to no longer wait many honors courses. In a perfect world, students would not be constantly labeled by numbers, test scores, and letter grades, but unfortunately, in reality, these labels are paramount when it comes to applying to college. But it is true that only the top 200 or so schools out of the approximate 3,000 colleges in the U.S. are classified as challenging to get into. Many of Laguna Beach High School's honor students strive and constantly challenge themselves to be admitted to one of these schools. It has been brought to my attention that the UC schools do not wait many of our honors courses, but why should we align our waiting system to match only nine of the 200 schools that have been identified as difficult and competitive to get into? The UC system already will identify and not take into account the weighted grades that don't match its standards, so what is the harm in continuing to wait these honors courses for the many other schools students will apply to? Honor students uphold the rigor and academic standards that LBHS prides itself with and celebrates. So why not encourage these students with a weighted grade instead of shying them away from a challenging course in fear of lowering their GPA? Laguna Beach is filled with so many talented, hardworking students, and I believe that all of these honor students would benefit by receiving a weighted grade or taking an honors course. Thank you. Terry Meisberger. Hello, and thank you for your presentation. I'm Terry Meisberger. As you've stated, um, you're aligning with the UC standard, even though 13% of Laguna High School students actually attend a UC. Even UC is very aware that high schools wait honors classes that are not approved by UC, and they have prepared for this. In fact, UC has clearly provided for non-UC approved honors courses per their website. And I quote, in some cases, a school categorizes the course as honors that is not accepted as such by the university. The course name that appears in your school's course list may contain the word honors, but lack the designation in the honors type column. It will not appear as an honors course in the application, nor will the grade be weighted in the UC GPA calculation. They understand that this happens, so they've prepared for it. Surrounding school districts allow for honors courses to be weighted, and they have more honors course offerings. Capistrano Unified, which has six high schools, Elisa Nagal, Dana Hill, San Juan, Tesoro, San Clemente, and Capitol Valley. They offer honors in AP World History, honors English 1 and 2, honors Biology, honors Algebra 2 slash Trig, honors Pre-Calc, honors Anatomy and Physiology, honors Chem, and honors Physics. Their course catalog clearly states in asterisks, as a ninth grade course, this course is not eligible to receive UC honors recognition. The course does have a weighted grade, which will be included in overall GPA calculations. Again, high schools are prepared and they're planning and they understand that this is how things are done. We want the board to focus on the 87% of the students at Laguna Beach High School. What is the harm in doing the same classification as other school districts, such as CAPO, also Orange, and many others? Even UC has clearly stated a policy for doing so. Let's present Laguna students in the best possible light 
and reward them for working hard and challenging themselves by taking honors courses and preparing themselves for AP and college coursework. This will again maximize their merit scholarships. I know we talked about USC. Very few Laguna students go to USC. It's on record that Boulder does not recalculate the transcript for their uh, admittance or for their merit scholarships. Also, University of Alabama will not recalculate. And there's many others. Again, what is the harm? GPA does matter. Let's reward our hardworking students. Please add this as an action item to the June 11th school board meeting to reinstate the honors grade weighting for all honors courses retroactively and reinstate accelerated geometry to honors. Again, reward our students and help them get ready for their AP and their college courses. Thank you. Alana Rosenberg. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say that I have a junior who's in private school at St. Chella and an incoming freshman at LBHS, so I'm speaking kind of from that perspective. The way I see it, it seems like LBHS falls between a private school like St. Chill and many of the public schools that are in the area, and I kind of feel it needs to go one way or the other. It appears that many of the public high schools do offer the weight for ninth and 10th grade classes, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the UC standards. Rather, it's about giving uh, students credit for more challenging workload. If LBHS does not want to weight certain honors or accelerated classes in ninth or 10th grade, then as far as I'm concerned, these classes shouldn't be offered. And this is the way it's done at St. Chill, where English and Spanish, you don't start getting the weight until you're in 11th grade for certain levels of classes. Everybody's in the same one. But if it's a question of honors classes at LBHS not meeting the standards of true honors classes that are offered elsewhere that merit a grade bump, then maybe these honors classes need to be made more rigorous, and maybe there needs to be more of a distinction between what a basic class is and an honors level class is at 9th and 10th grade. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle Sinclair. Thank you. My name is Michelle Sinclair. My daughter uh, is Madison Sinclair, and I'm a sophomore at the high school. Um, I didn't know we were time, so I don't have a written speech, so I'm going to just work off my notes here. But basically, she's taking Spanish two honors, not getting credit for it, English, not getting credit. I feel like I don't even know why we went to this UC standard. UC is not the end all. So why we even went to it, I don't even understand. But you went to it, you thought it was the end all. But then it seems like you're cherry picking. Are you cherry picking or not? I mean, why now do we have these added UC weighted classes? Why weren't they there before? Why are we adding them now? I mean, it, let's get our ducks in a row, let's present it and let's do it right. And let's us be the judge. Why do we have to have it be the UC? There's lots of other schools our kids go to. My daughter's going to an out of state college. She was in the same class as Peggy's daughter. She's going to an out of state college. There's lots of great schools. UC's not the end all. So I really don't appreciate this added UC weighted honors. Now, finally, are you cherry picking? What's, what is this? Are you doing it the UC way or are you not? And if you are, then why are these just now added? She's not screwed on her GPA, I'll be real honest with you. Not getting uh, the honors, I don't appreciate. I think this thing here about what UC, USC said, I think this is really odd, this quote that you found. So I'm just going to bring it up. In general, more A's is better. <laughs> okay. Well, what does that mean? If they just take the general classes, they get more A's. If they take the harder on the honors, they don't get the boost for it. So I think it, it's dumbing down our system because we're just trying to get more people in because we're, we're afraid that somehow it's going to affect their GPA in a negative way because these kids can't do it. So I, I think that quote's really interesting. Um, let's see. I think that if it benefits our students, why not just do it? Like, what's the big issue with it? Do it. It benefits them. It helps them. Let's do it. I don't, I don't understand this. Why we don't give it to them? I really don't. Uh, my daughter's seen a huge disadvantage. Why your charts maybe show that, oh, the same amount of people are taking or maybe more? Well, because we're told that rigor is important. So that's why they're taking it. But then they, don't, they put all the effort in, they don't get the bump. If this is honors, then they should get the bump. I mean, if, if the issue is, when you're not making an honors, it's not hard enough, then get it where it's hard enough. Okay, so I don't understand that either. Um, 
anyway, I think class rank's really important, and I think there's a lot of schools that don't calculate, and I think this is just sort of done misguided, and I don't understand why, you know, everything's about the UC, okay, because there's lots of schools that kids apply to, and I'm really disappointed with this, and I'm waiting for this bump, and I'm wondering, how long is this bump going to take? These classes that you put in here, uh, to be determined, two years, what are we going to hear, in two years, or in a year? I mean, on is it golden? Hi, I'm Monica Golden. I have four kids in the district. Um, I wanted to first kick off the script and talk about um, the enrollment that's not decreasing for the honors courses. Um, you can't just jump into an AP course, maybe one or two at our school. So you have to take the honors courses. Uh, you have to take uh, honors algebra two to take AP calculus. Ask the math department. That is not optional. Also with English, you need to be on a certain course to get to the AP. So now, if the only way you can get a grade bump is to take the AP, you're going to take the honors courses. Because you can't just jump in. So that's why you're saying that. And I also want to address that when you're doing the research and presenting things, you should go and talk to the, the colleges that are unweight, that are not unweighting the GPAs. Why is University of Oregon, UC Boulder, not in this presentation? Because there would be a quote saying, that we do not unweight them. But we're only seeing the ones that say what you want us to hear. Okay. There are certain thresholds for GPA that you have to reach to get scholarships at some schools, and some universities will make it equal across all schools by unweighting GPAs, and some won't. Some colleges recalculate GPAs for admission based on their own formulas, but some don't. Weighting all honors courses may impact a small number of students, but the impact it has is significant. By decreasing our students' GPA, students are put at a disadvantage for admittance into college and scholarships um, at universities that don't distinguish between weighted and unweighted. University of Oregon and UC Boulder, we had 11 graduates last year that attended those two universities, and I don't know how many applied. Um, and we were also told five to six of these high-ranking uh, colleges do not unweight. And I didn't have time to research all the other ones. Why would the board want to put all of our students who apply to these schools at a disadvantage? What is the harm in giving our students the weighted GPA in all honors courses? All I can find is harm in not weighting them. Harming those who would not make the cutoff for automatic scholarships, harming those who apply to colleges that don't recalculate, and harming those who apply to many non-university affiliated scholarships that don't unweight GPAs. In my research, I found that some high schools give two GPAs. They internally weight only certain courses, in our case, maybe the UC-approved weighted courses. They then give weighted GPAs for all honors courses for purposes of college's acceptance and scholarship. The reason for the internal weight is to encourage students to take courses that aren't weighted and be more well-rounded. The internal weight is used for class rank and valedictorian. The way I see it is to fix the problem of weight internally as a school, but to continue to allow our students the full weight of honors courses on their transcripts when sending them for college admittance and scholarship. Um, as a former class of 1992 valedictorian of Laguna Beach High School, I hate to see the class rank eliminated. I think it motivates students to achieve at the highest level. Um, lastly, I wanted to say that Laguna Beach School District vows to support every student every day. Waiting, uh, with the waiting change, it is not supporting every student every day. It is only supporting those who are applying to certain colleges and those that are not, are not being supported. I have more to say, but... Jason Hoffs. Um, your graphs suggest that kids are not disincented from taking difficult classes by the unweighting, and I, I hope that's the case. Our own experiences my daughter had no interest in science when she took Mr. Sogo's honors chem class. It was difficult for her. She struggled at times. She ended up, I think, like getting an A in the class, but she was totally turned on to science. So then she, she took ACR. She loved that. She had an independent research project. He hooked her up with a lab at uh, UCI where she did research over the summer. She decided that she wanted to go chemistry. She was admitted last year to uh, Stanford. She's doing chemical engineering. She's trying to solve the world, world's sort of 
meat problems by, by creating sort of animal protein, like Beyond Burgers, that mimics meat. And it all started with like Steve Sogo's class. None of us in our family are into chemistry. We're liberal arts people. What she's doing is unfathomable. And I just hope that people, that, that the kids aren't disincented from reaching to take really, really hard classes. We're always going to be grateful to LBUSD and your teachers till, till we die because of you know the great things that you did for our daughter. You give her credit for taking Mandarin a few years ago when nobody had done that before, and that helped her get into school too. So I just want to say thanks, and please do everything possible to keep the kids reaching. I know they shouldn't have to be incented by getting a five, but maybe they are, and uh, that's it. Thanks. David Flores? Brian Judd. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Chair and uh, Board Members. Uh, I do regret having not submitted my card before my wife and daughter, so I can speak after that, which is tough to follow. Um, I'm here to request that the Board reinstate weighted grades for honors uh, courses and restore students' desire to challenge themselves with more rigorous academic coursework. At the last board meeting to discuss the issue, we were told that uh, removing weighted grades from honors courses was not about removing a harm, uh, but that it was about setting policy and meeting standards. What I don't understand, and why I somewhat question the sincerity of that, is that I didn't hear any cause for concern and that we, that we weren't meeting these standards, uh, or any board members asking the superintendent uh, what he was doing immediately to correct the problem. Rather, what I heard, or at least I took away from that discussion, uh, is that the best solution to not meeting the standards was to simply drop the incentive for taking such courses. Uh, the district does a great job helping the students uh, that fall behind, those that might have uh, learning disabilities or have interests outside of the traditional academic curriculum. All important responsibilities that this board fulfills. But it seems to me, just based on uh, what I heard at the last meeting and what I witnessed with my high school daughter and making those choices about uh, weighted courses, now, when it comes to those students who want to challenge themselves more, uh, the, themselves most academically, the district doesn't seem to take that obligation quite as seriously. Maybe it does, but it's hard to find that out otherwise from uh, my recent involvement in this. Uh, I'm not sure what impact you thought that removing weighted grades uh, would have on our young students, but it certainly doesn't seem to increase their desire to continue to challenge themselves with low reward. Or of even more concern is that you did consider that and made the decision in spite of it. Um, one of the things I, I did want to uh, ask about was where is this policy about uh, removing the weighted grades when we don't meet these criteria, or what is the foundation for that? And I saw the, the one policy on the website that talks about uh, the UC criteria, but it doesn't really provide a lot of direction on what is going to happen when, when they don't. Um, as I understand it, I think it was an action that the, the, the board took. It's not a policy, um, but it's all about policy, correct? Right? So, um, and just navigating the website and trying to find the, the basis for making that kind of a decision was very difficult. Um, I write policy for a living uh, for local jurisdictions throughout California. So I came up with a couple policy suggestions to kind of help uh, maybe provide some, some insight on making these kinds of decisions. And I would feel a lot more comfortable that there is some sincerity about um, helping those kids that are really academically uh, motivated. One, we enthusiastically, we, the board, community enthusiastically support our students to seek to challenge themselves through a wide range of academic courses, including AP and honors courses. That's a policy. We reward those students seeking more challenging academic courses with weighted grades and averages. We rigorously maintain appropriate standards for honors courses, and we evaluate our honors courses annually to ensure that they meet standards deemed appropriate by the board. If a course is determined to fall short of a standard, we allocate appropriate resources to ensure that they meet the standards within one academic year. Can you send that to me? Are you 
We just had to make a motion to extend the amount of time. Oh, thank you. Sorry, I don't think you can hear Jan. Sorry. Oh, yeah. She was letting us know. Like, sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. Are we wanting to put them back in? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So I feel like if having the honors classes weighted that you unweighted was such a bad thing, you wouldn't have phased it out. You would have just stopped it right then. No more for now you have kids who are taking honors classes, I think it ends this year, right? They're all graduating with the bump. If it was such a big deal, then you would have stopped it for everyone at the same time, instead of phasing it out like that. Or you would have had your ducks in a row, like someone else said, and made sure that you had honors classes that were qualified. We have how many? Super, three assistant superintendents? It's like a superintendent for each school, and we can't get our classes certified? I mean, and no offense, but that presentation, if that's what you base your decision off of, that's embarrassing. And that's probably why Bill Lansiedel said we didn't have enough information to go ahead with that and that you should wait. And out of like 4,200 schools in the country, four-year universities, you look at three that most of the kids will never even apply to because it's so out of their reach. I mean, how do you make a decision like that off of three universities and the SAT the new diversity score is being adopted right away the, the president of the college board has said over 150 schools are immediately putting that into their admissions so I don't know why you would disadvantage kids and I don't believe the numbers on the the honors class admission staying the same because I've had teachers say we don't have as many kids dropping the class. Now we only have kids who really want to take the class. So if that's true, then the other one can't be true. And when you have a dip for one year and then a surge the next year, you have like different students every year. So and for like my kids, I make them take the honors English. I want them to be able to write something by the time they graduate. So they take it anyway. But they're working harder and getting less reward. So. I don't know what world that makes sense in. I don't know you guys would sit on this board just out of the goodness of your heart if you weren't getting something back for it. Just like everyone else in life. And we do have to bribe our kids. I still bribe them with cake and cookies and whatever. They're, they're kids, they're teenagers. So, you know, it's just a really short-sighted decision. And I think you really need to look at this again. And you need to put it back on and vote, let's see what the new board votes on it. And see what existing board members want to vote on it. So, thank you. John Morelli. So obviously I, I usually don't even get involved with this stuff because I have a business to run and it's not really time efficient to sit around every night because that's kind of your guys job what you do you and the board um, and I'm not going to cite any of the statistics or look at the index I, I really feel like the, the presentation if, like, again what my wife said if that's what it was based on I don't I don't think that's cool but I really want to point to one thing that I think is most important and that is that you've had such pushback on this and yet and if you guys don't have to write any of this down, because I don't really care if you can, because like, you could look up Jason Ward, please. I would appreciate if you would pay attention when people are speaking, because I know you sit there and write your notes, and you're not looking at people, but there's there's human beings standing here, people who are really upset about what's going on. I know, I'm talking to the board, and you, though, you're here. Point being is that this decision was made a long time ago, and if you can't see what it's doing to the community, Okay. between the calendar change and the honors, and forget about the statistics for it. You have I'm a thousand people signing a petition saying, this is screwed up, revisit it. We're not asking you to change it. We're asking you to revisit it and look at it and say, maybe we are human too. Maybe, maybe we could have made a mistake. And right now, what it feels like is everybody's just like, okay, we'll let them speak their piece, and we're going to do what we're going to do anyway. That's what it feels like, and that's what the, the community feels so frustrated.
come in here every Tuesday night when you guys are here and try to get you to even listen. But the point being is that this needs to be revisited. This needs to be put on the agenda. You need to hear new evidence, if that's what we're calling it, and not just at reports that are generated that fit the narrative. Okay, I really feel like everything I see, it just it just goes right, you know, and I'll tell you, I, I see presentations all day, every day, for every kind of company trying to sell us things and do things. Okay, we take it all with a pound of salt. Okay, so when we come in here, don't expect we're just going to go, oh, that looks great. Three schools, really, I, I look at that and go, really, I don't even want my kids to go to any of those schools, honestly. No offense to anybody who's Stanford or wherever, but there's plenty of schools. If there's 800 or 1,000 schools that are looking at weighted GPAs, what? I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. There's, to me, there's no logic in it. It needs to be revisited. It's 2019. It's been three years. Maybe things have changed since that report came out or since the data that was collected and the decisions that were made happened, and I think it just needs to be revisited. Thank you. Acknowledge. Thank you. Um, as the parent of two children, one of whom you just recognized tonight, that they're grade of three, doing such amazing things already. Um, yeah, I, I understand the, the deck that was presented. I understand all the numbers. I'm not here to compete against that. I'm here to ask a more cool question. When you're looking at these children that are asking for our help, why are we not giving it to them? This costs us nothing. It's not a board request. It's not a lawsuit. It's nothing but difficulty to this board. It's something that these children are asking for, and there really isn't any reason not to. If you look at the statistics that are on here, if you want to go into all of that, there's nothing that penalizes them against the UC. So that's where they go, terrific. My family's been great benefits of that system. But I think that my son and others can go well beyond that. They're in a game that is a world-class game. This is the Olympics of education. It is getting more difficult. I'm hiring more and more people from all around the world to do the things that we want to do and pay the highest dollars. If these kids want to do that, if they want to be a part of that, and they want to lead Laguna into the future, we need to offer them what they're asking. I don't see anything in the numbers that I've been testing. I don't see anything else in that. I understand there are some that will, and I respect that. I am simply asking you, if this is what the kids are asking us for, if it costs us nothing, we got to honor that. If it makes them better, if it gives them that Olympic size, small little difference between whether they get into somewhere or not, great. If we go with the numbers here that said tonight that only 15% got in and about 40% that applied, the other 25% went somewhere else. Why did we give them a disadvantage at wherever else they wanted to go? Or did they, they didn't get into that UC system, they probably went somewhere else these kids started going somewhere. So I ask you to, to look at this carefully and to think about these kids. The ones that are going to do this. And they're going to do it despite whatever decision we make time. Most of them are that are want to win and want to compete in that are going to do it. Don't we want to support them? Don't we want them to see us and say, they did it for me time? There's nothing that they're asking other than their chance. So please give it to them. So sorry, I was cleaning my parents' house and I rushed here as soon as, soon as I could um, because I really care about, I'm sure you guys care a lot about our students. I know that that's why you guys are here. And I feel like I have to come, I know I'm a big mess, but, but please, you know, please realize that, you know, I'm sure you know it's very challenging to get to college. Last year was considered one of the hardest ever to get into college and it's getting more and more competitive. So can you help our kids, please just eat a little bit, counts. And I hate to say that, but it's just, it's, it is getting competitive. So please help our kids. And I know people on the board, most of you I do know very well. And I, I hope you feel in your heart that any little bit, if you can help them, would, would be really appreciated. Like, the, like you said, you know, just support them. There's nothing to lose. Show that this school district is amazing. We care about our kids. We care about what happens to them, not only now, but in the future. So any little help you can give them. They would feel it, and the parents would, you know, really appreciate it. And please help create. My son was saying that, you know, there's no justice in this world. It's ridiculous. I have to take this honors class, but for me, our family, we encourage our kids you know, to take the most rigorous class as possible. But in reality, with the colleges, I hate to say this, but I heard from a reliable source, 
when they're going through like thousands and thousands of applications, they don't check for each student in the river. They're going to scan it and go to, okay, GPA and test score, well, okay. Unless the other factors are involved, like, um, you know, handicap or something, the special needs or, you know, a neutral situation. But they kind of scan through it, and from there, then they dissect it in detail from there. But they, they don't have time for the 10 and 20,000 application to go into detail to see which class they took, the rigors. So that kind of realistic, you know, facts of life. But I know you guys care about the kids. So just, you know, help them as much as that you can. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Jerry Morgan. Said. Um, there's a couple things that weren't mentioned that I think are important to um, to recall, um, and it kind of reflects back on some of the things I said earlier. Um, you have a lot of very intelligent community members here, and that is who you represent, and that is who pays the taxes in this city. And if they're asking for certain things, then it's your responsibility to reflect on what they're asking, get more information, and maybe possibly make a different decision. Two years ago, they did change the calendar because the board came to the realization that maybe they made a mistake. And mistakes are okay. And if we admit to our mistakes, isn't that one of the ways that we want our children to learn? Make mistakes early, make them often, so you can fix it. So, a couple of the things that have not been mentioned is some of the philosophies and objectives that are listed on the board website. Um, for example, number three, every student in the district has a right to be free from discrimination, harassment, and intimidation. Well, we're talking about the students, I'm thinking, but isn't this the same thing? Why would an English 10 student not take the honors course or vice versa? If one of the biggest running jokes in the school, if you ask the students anonymously, is, well, yeah, I'm not getting a 4.0 because I'm not taking honors. I'm actually getting a 3.7, but I'm taking honors and it's not weighted, so therefore my rank is lower than somebody's rank who's not taking honors. It's a fact. Kids talk about it, and they feel intimidated if they say something. So that kind of goes against your philosophy. Uh, number six, the sage. Safe, nurturing environment, positive school climate are necessary for learning, academic achievement, and student development. Isn't there a differential? Because right now there's so much focus on the bottom 20 and bringing them up, and I know that because I've been involved in a lot of the committee meetings, that it's continually talked about how the top 20% are not supported the way they need to be. People are right. There's only 23 Cal State schools and nine UC students. There are nine UC schools, so why are we making that our bench point of what our district does? This district has the ability to be sensational, like a nationwide, above and beyond what they already are. But if we try to mainstream all these little things that we're putting in, then we're not stepping outside the box and taking the advantage of what all of these intelligent people and yourselves have to offer. Number, I like this one too. Um, number 16, the community and district are inextricably connected partners wherein the community's engagement and issues that impact the schools, schools enhance the district's program and student learning. Number 17, two-way communication with all stakeholders is essential. So many of these decisions are being made without the back and forth, and yet we sit here and we have points and comments to be made, but we aren't allowed to engage in conversation. Two weeks ago, or a month ago, we had the distinct, lovely pleasure of sitting here and being berated by Board Member Wolf because her opinion about the waiting was different than everybody else. And the same thing happened at the calendar. It's not appropriate for the Board to push their own agendas through. So, I suggest you put it on the agenda next time so it can be re-voted. Thank you. Yeah, did David Flores come back? Yeah, David Flores. Yes, he did. It's your turn. My son is uh, taking MUN and uh, he has to eat, so I have to go over and get him some food. Mm -hmm. His class doesn't end until 9. Um, I think uh, I missed most of what everybody has said already. Uh, I think you get the gist of the concern from parents that our kids are not given a level playing field with kids from surrounding districts. And I know you think that you had an academic task force that went ahead and studied this, well, they didn't do a good job, to be very honest with you. And it's not a criticism, they just did not. I did a lot of research. 
I sent the research to the superintendent, uh, pointing out how many school districts um, are doing what we're asking you to do. And all of the surrounding school districts are doing that. Uh, one of my uh, mentees is currently the superintendent of uh, San Diego County Office of Education. I have a number of folks that are very high ranking superintendents and so forth that I mentor. This particular gentleman, when uh, I had a conversation with him about what this board has done, his response is, why would a board do something like that to kids? And why would a superintendent allow that board to do that? That is just plain wrong. And I am quoting him. Now, he supervises all the superintendents technically in San Diego County, uh, for the San Diego area. Very knowledgeable, great guy. And uh, you might want to give him a call and ask him his opinion of what you are doing to our children. Thank you. Ooh, is there any other public comment from anyone who did not submit a card? Those are all the comments on the cards that are submitted. And that will end the public comment on this item and I'll uh, close the board discussion. That's one of the questions the board direction request. Yeah, uh, she could ask questions. We didn't get to ask questions. After the presentation. Because it was an information. Do you want questions or comments? Or oh, it's information. Okay. Okay. Um, question. Um, thanks for your presentation. I, I wondered, since so many of our students do go out of state, why no out of state schools were contacted? At the time, I, I selected three of the students, uh, three of the colleges and universities that um, students have reported high interest in, and I reached out to them. Should the board direct, I can I can search for outside state. Um, I also wonder. So, looking at the reasons for what was done before, one was to encourage students per to participate in Rivers Path. How, how did the waiting help them to encourage them to go on, to participate in reverse pathways? Right. It offered them a level, level playing field. So, for example, with more language, uh, it didn't pit one particular world language against the other. It also offered the students the opportunity to follow their passion. Um, could you explain that a little bit more about following their passion and how <laughs> waiting to help them? Sure. So if you passion. were a student that took French, for example. Okay, but let's skip the foreign language. Okay. So just rigorous courses. So our students have the opportunity to take, uh, we have multiple honors and AP weighted courses. Students have the opportunity to take a course that it appeals to them, that, that we offer multiple opportunities, and and in addition to that, we also want to align to the UC. So when they approve the course, that's still weighted. So, <laughs> so you think that if a course is not weighted, then students will be more likely to take an honors course that isn't weighted? No, I'm no. So uh, at the time. Uh, my predecessor, that was a part of the goal, right? That it allowed all students to take um, multiple honors weighted courses. It did unweight courses that the UC system did not indicate were weighted. So, example, nine honors isn't weighted for mm -hmm. UC. At the time, 10 honors was not weighted as well. And many of our neighbors also unweighted 10 honors at that same time. So it allows students the opportunity, for example, for English 9 and 10, to do the prerequisite courses that prepared them for AP, as some of our speakers have talked about. We, we, when we studied our students that took honors 9 and 10 in English, they were well prepared 
for the for AP Lit and AP Lake, we looked at we did a deep study of cohort stability, and we saw that students that took English nine, English ten did very well in AP Lit and AP Lang. So for so to answer your question, um, it offered students the opportunities to, to do to be well prepared to take honors eight and AP weighted courses, but it was all that prerequisite work. So if they take regular honors English 9 and English 10, they were well prepared for the AP course? 9 honors. And oh, nine, 9 honors yes. and 9 10. So And did. how did weighting it make them, how did that change it? If, they, if, 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 if 9 was unweighted, if honors 9 was unweighted, how did that make it more likely or rigorous for them to take that? I do. I, I'm not. I'm not understanding how unweighting honors English nine helped the students. I don't. That's right. It's we weren't here for so right, yeah. part of the challenge we have is passing uh, judgment on the committee work because I wasn't here when it happened, nor was um, a Dr. Debo. So we're simply trying. We simply use the presentation that was provided to us and the documentation that we've had. But I, I can't answer some of the, in working with Dr. Adipo, some of the questions related to the understanding of the committee because we weren't part of that. So to the best of our ability, we, we simply try to respond to the questions that came from the board at the last meeting. Um, but in, in that instance, that'd be really difficult for us to fully uh, understand what the actual question is. How did it benefit them by reducing mm -hmm. the honors? Yes. Yes. I, I couldn't speak to that. But it would be you like can't know if we were on the board at that time, but you were, and you, you were calling the discussions or the rationale that took place at that time. <clears throat> so um, it would be difficult for them to recall that, but I mean, it would be. Well, right, what I recall was the teachers, and Sogo was mentioned, especially Sogo, the teachers really wanted a standard in which to evaluate classes and to grow into if they were not, so all their peers were working at the same level and really reduce. <coughs> the inequities around oral languages so that we could have Mandarin and other options of languages that we wouldn't have because we wouldn't have kids attending them. And that was the teacher's explanations to us, was not from the committee, but from the teachers directly. And, um, and I have to thank the parents who did bring it forward because looking at it allowed, because they were not here, but when Dr. Morris got a lot of information from different parents, he was able to look and say, well, wait a minute, were we supposed to apply the UC standard going forward or what it was then? Right, so he really had to talk to the board members that were on and ask what it was it that we were doing, which goes back to Mr. Judd's point that it's better in a policy than an action item. Right, something like this is better in a policy. Um, because then they would have a policy to follow versus the action item. Do we mean just write them whatever it was or do we mean going forward we want you to adjust? And we clarified that we want them going forward to adjust so they had applied and as soon as that's approved, it gets moved back retro. So no, everyone experiences the bump. No one loses the bump. The kids graduate now don't lose the bump, except for nine and Spanish, because those aren't part of the standard. And teachers like having parameters that they all equal your working under. And that's what they asked of us, is to look at standards, look what other schools do, and determine what we can apply as a district so that everyone can determine the rigor of an honors class. And not like, honors basket or whatever it is, right? Not come up with obscure classes, but classes that are recognized. And so that was the point of it. Um, and the UC system continues to change what, it's a fluid system. So just like with their AG. The other thing it did is allowed us to have a lot of AP classes that we didn't have. They created a, I think a belief in the teachers from what I've heard from various teachers, that the kids are actually in their classroom because they want to learn this, which inspires them. Not because their parents told them they had to take it because it gives them a bump in their you know, point or whatever it is. A little increment bump that gives them in there. Right. But I have to say, I'm looking at what the grades are for what kids get in honor classes versus what they get in regular classes. I have a junior who's been through this. Hi. Glad I didn't know ahead of time because I would have pushed him in honor classes in areas he did not have any passion. Because you're more likely getting an A or B in the honors class than you are in a regular class by a substantial percentage. So. Um, kids that are in those classes love to learn. They want to master information. And that's why they go in the class. And it's not an area they like. Like the gentleman who said they had no idea about science, but so go, you know, wrap their daughter and daughter in and pulled them in. 
And that got her excited about something her family might not have pushed her to go explore. And so I think the freedom for the teachers, they took it as, these kids really want to be in my class. And that is important. It's equally important that they want to be there and they want to learn, and not that they want to hear it. Because if you, we, we can often be told, don't look at Capo, look at Capo. Don't look at Capo, look at Capo. I look nationwide. Mostly don't. Mostly don't look. The majority is don't ever consider, don't ever compare us to Capo. I can't believe you compared us to Capo. Um, and so when I look nationally, these nationally ranked high schools, they don't rank anything. They don't give, as any human spoke, time long past, they don't give a carrot for them to do. The carrot is they learn and they're challenged and they kind of self-select the students they're with and the kids can jump in because they really love something passionate but they don't take all of it. And that's the social emotional um, side effect of that is what the benefit is. And then I have been so privileged to be able to sit with college administrators who evaluate how to create classes and set these workshops and um, I know you guys say there's no cost to giving the great credit, but there is. There's an entitlement cost. If these kids don't have resilience, they're going to fall apart the moment they fall asleep. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm serious. I, I, I'm still, I'm still questioning yes, why, why we're going by the UC standard. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so Thank I'm going to address a few things. The UC standard is not created because everyone applies to the UC standard. The UC standard was created because the UC standard is well respected worldwide. No, it's not. Worldwide? Michelle, yes. you are not to interrupt me. Oh, here goes. Sherry, I do not berate. I'm stating my opinion. I'm elected to the board and I'm stating my opinion. I do want to state that some people in this group have completely overstepped by requesting private information about my children in a public records request and private information about me. I, I support that you have a different opinion than I have, but to disparage me and my children personally is over the line. It's over the line, you guys. I disagree with your position on the policy. The UC standard is well respected. We are meeting it. Before we had no criteria. Honors classes could be willy-nilly and not have criteria. We're telling our students in AP US History and AP Euro that that is a valuable college level course. And Honors English 9 is not equal to that. We, we know that our school profile matters in admissions to students. I think it needs to be brought up more that every transcript gets the school profile. And that school profile tells admissions, this is what we do. We can disagree on the policy, but I believe this is a sound policy with good criteria. We are applying to retroactively add those two courses that the UC approves, not because everyone applies to the UC, because the standard is a high, well-regarded policy. Um, I just think that there's been some nastiness behind the scenes that I do not want to engage with with my children. And I'm utterly offended when it happened. My children aren't part of the debate. The policy is. And I, I totally respect that you might disagree with me. But I'm okay with that. But I wasn't on the board when this was implemented. I was on the task force as a parent. And I have a child in the old system and I have a child in the new system. And I, my children take rigor because strength of schedule. They take courses that will show up on their transcript whether they have an honors bump or not and will show the value and hard work that they do. That's the reward, is the strength of schedule. To think that it's just in a number I think is false and I, I can disagree with you respectfully. I, I believe the policy is sound and I believe the district erred in not reviewing Honors English 10 and the other honors, Algebra 2, when it started to be accepted by the UC. That was an error on their part. And so now we're fixing that, and that could retroactively go into place. But I, our job is to have an opinion here. I'm not berating anyone. I just want to be respected. You come and speak your opinion. I respect that. But the behind-the-scenes stuff that's gotten really mean is really shocking to me. So 
this is my position. I think it's a sound policy, and I think the district's responsibility is to always make sure we review our coursework, that it fits within that standard. That's my opinion. Um, so I'm in an interesting position because I am the student representative, which means I can listen openly to both sides of the story. Um, one thing I was noticing is just that something that was brought into light when I was applying to the colleges, um, at least for my own worries, was I had no idea where I was going to get in. I have all the numbers, and even still, thank you. <laughs> and even still, I was unsure of even the easiest colleges if I could go there. And maybe that was just my own self confidence or things that I had heard from past students, but I know for sure that was a worry of mine. Um, from you know the information provided, I see that both private colleges and public colleges are recalculating their GPAs. Um, so I feel that if it's already being recalculated, perhaps at the time this I, and I wasn't here from when it was decided, but maybe it was just a way of giving people more clarity as to where they could get in. Um, I know that at one point I was talk, speaking to our college career center lady and. We we're going with my transcript, and I'm like, so what's GPA are they going to look at? And they're like, well, it could be any of them. And I was like, well, that's scary. Like, <laughs> and now we're learning that you know, they can recalculate it to their own standards. So um, one other thing I want to say was that perhaps the reason why we are now doing it to the UC standards is to just give more clarity as to what your GPA is going to look like from the, college, the college's perspective. Perhaps we can now see eye to eye as to, is this really the GPA that they're going to be seeing? Yes, it is, because we've had it standardized, and that's what they're going to be seeing. Um, I think, for me, just knowing that it's a little bit closer, it allowed me to you know, have more confidence, and yes, I will get in, no, I will not get in. It helps me know where I should even be applying. Um, and I still think that there's a lot of opinions to be made for myself and for others, so thank you for listening. I want to thank you for the presentation, and uh, I, as former president of a university and as a provost uh, in the CSU system, um, and as someone who has spent my whole career uh, in, in the academy, uh, I do know that nearly all colleges recalculate their admissions GPA of students. There may be six to ten that do not, and they do not do it for some unique and reasons that have to do with the states that they're in and the number of out-of-state students that they can take in and the number of foreign students that they, they, they can take in. But nearly every college in the United States does the recalculation because it's all over the place. I am sticking with the board's decision as far as to um, stick with the policy that was uh, which was uh, voted on in 2016. As previously, I one of my big concerns was the scholarship aspect, which is not re, in most colleges. It's not recalculated. And I think because we have so many students that don't go to UC schools, we are giving them a disadvantage by not waiting their grades for scholarships. Um, many of our students, you know, they don't try for those, those top 200 schools. And a scholarship makes a huge difference for them. And I think we need to look at that. I also think because there are so many, a significant number of the public, our constituents, that are upset about this, that it should be brought back as an action item. Um, I think it should be looked at both sides. We do have new information now on what's happening, and I think it's really important to bring it back. Yeah. Regarding scholarships, I just had one follow-up. There's a decreasing number of high school students available to colleges to recruit and to admit. And because of that, uh, excluding those 100, 150 exclusives, uh, these, this, the scholarship deals uh, are, are there on the table for you to get. And they, uh, they will recalculate, they will do anything they can to get you to sign uh, the, on the dotted line to come to this large number of colleges who a number of them are on the way to 
extinction because of declining student populations. It's easier to get into college today than it ever was because of supply and demand. The ones that, the Harvards, the Yales, you're going to have a hard time if you have all A's and uh, outstanding scores. It's, it's, just, it's just the way it is. But, but the scholarship money, it's there, and you can be competitive as far as with, with dealing with the admissions offices. I don't know how many of you have had admissions officers calling you every day, every week, trying to get your children to sign on the dotted line. The competition is there. Well, I know in certain states, they take the weighted GPA and as what they're looking at, and if you're you don't have as many, much weight in your GPA. They're going to look at that. Also, um, that by not, when students often apply at the beginning of their senior year for college, they don't have their senior GPA. So they're looking at freshmen, sophomore, junior. Some don't look at freshmen. I know you see this, but many colleges do. And by not waiting in the freshman classes, they also have a lower GPA. Just a point of clarification. We uh, the only freshman class we don't wait is honors English 9. So if this freshman takes um, an AP class uh, or an honors level course, so for example, we do have some freshmen who might be in honors algebra 2, they actually will get the weight. Um, so AP classes, et cetera, but they do, would just, they would get that. So the only one that currently is ninth grade specific would be ninth grade. Spanish. Spanish 2 honors, I understand, is, is not a specific ninth grade course. It's, it's uh, there are students that are in 10th and ninth grade in classes. I know one thing that was mentioned were that there were AP classes that were not available to freshmen. And they wish there was more AP classes available. Yeah, there are certain that prerequisites for sure, right? Um, but the computer science classes are available. Uh, Composite principle is not A because A requires a calculus level um, um, understanding. So, um, but yeah, some require prerequisites. Yeah. Was was something else that we didn't have computer science either? Now I'm better at computer science because of this change and kind of looking at things. Inspired. And so that's something in ninth grade they can take. I had our ninth graders in there with 12th graders and the school mm -hmm. mix. And so that's they right. can get it. they can get that bone in ninth grade. Um, one one comment and I would really like to see what policies there are on weighted trade and stuff because it is I firmly believe that we stand in policy, right? And um, but yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I firmly believe we stand in policy. And I don't know in the transition or anything that happened around the same time as folks. I would just like to just an update just to see policies. Okay, um, just a little my perspective, my perspective, which I'm sure will not be well received by those of you who have spoke, spoken to us. But reflecting back to when uh, this issue came up before, and of course the board doesn't make the evaluation of the curriculum at the high school, the rigor of the courses that's done on, on site. But there was a concern that Laguna was gaining a reputation as a great inflated school. And, and that doesn't go well with admissions officers when, when you earn that reputation. And there was concern of making it more genuine, and that, uh, and that was part of that discussion. That, Peggy probably did not set in that task force as part of the discussion. Prior to that, prior to this issue, there was a time when there were um, other board members than we have now where the concern was about the profile. The profile was the focus point and the fact that our profile needed to reflect the rigor that we offered the students. In fact, we had a task force on academic rigor and it was to bump that up not anything to do with, with weighted grades or grade bumps, just the fact that we needed to have more rigorous course offerings at the high school. And that's, that's been a focus for a number of years, and we have, I think, accomplished that to a great degree. Um, obviously, just with the ability to, for freshmen to take AP classes, that did not exist um, just even a short time ago. So they, for the students who are able to handle that, able to handle the intensity of the work, there is some opportunity for that. Um, that's, I think, to me, was, was the heart of it, thinking back to what I heard other board members uh, talking about, was the concern that we not uh, 
be trapped by great inflation, that we be, that we be a school that looked at the rigor and challenging the students to take rigor for what would be a more long range, if you want, I don't, I, I'm not real comfortable with the term reward, but the more long-term outcome. If the long-term outcome, if you take the honors class in ninth grade, and then you move into the 10th grade, which we anticipate the, the approval, that would, I'm using English in my, in my mind, you don't know that. Then they move into the honors class in 10th grade, prepares them for the AP classes, which they need that preparation. And so I, I'm hoping that we teach our students that that's what the end reward is. The reward is that they are challenging themselves to get there in one or two more years, and that then they're prepared to do that work it's because that AP class is going to carry a lot more weight on their transcript than the honors class did. If they take an honors class and, they, and get a grade bump from it, and then they decide not to take the AP class, I think that's going to be recognized also. They're, they're looking at the individual students' course choices, the rigor of those choices. They're looking at the school profile. So, I mean, I, I feel very strongly that we are offering a strong program, but, but taking the focus away from you do it because you challenge yourself, and there is a great reward in challenging yourself, doing hard work, and getting a top grade. And we do have those calculations that came from, I think, Amy Hunthausen's question at that last meeting, that in the honors and AP classes, the grades are mostly A's and B's. And that is not the case in classes that are not honors and AP. So it's, I think, it, I think that balances it out, as I said, I know that's not well received by the comments that we're here tonight. Um, I just have one little other comment that, for myself personally, I'm very wary of surveys, particularly online surveys. When I look at those, and those are assigned by people who live in other states, and we had that also with the calendar issue. And there's no authenticity. There's no way to really know who is signing it, and numbers don't don't. For me, I can't respond just to a totally large number because I don't know if that's... We did analyze the calendar issue. There were repetitions, there were multiple county members, and some that actually signed twice. So similar with you know, anything that's um, with anonymity, that's why I appreciate that you do come and you uh, speak to us and we know who you are and we hear your concerns. Now we have one... A board member that's asking to have this come back to an action item, and I don't know if there's any other support for that. So there is not um, support for that coming back to an action item. And the other policy question from Member Rowe. Okay. Thank you. We move on to our action items tonight. The like. first action item is item 14, Mosaic Network Incorporated, Pro Vitality App, California Student Privacy Agreement, and Scope of Services for the 2019-20 school year at a cost not to exceed $8,505. Dr. Zippo. Thank you. So this is a continuation of our contract with Mosaic. We'll continue with your approval to use them for the 12th grade screeners. Any public comment on this item? Or questions? Or just a question? No. Yeah. Just. Is this the same price as last year? It is. That's it. Thanks. Motion, please. So the second. You know, I did have a question. Okay. So when um, I just and I meant to ask Dr. Bomoria today in our meeting, but um, what? Who reads the contracts and just make sure that they're current? Like, can they make sure that they're current with the current laws? Because I know privacy laws continue to change. I know we keep up with laws and stuff. I just don't know. Is it based on where the contract falls? Like, who it falls under? Or is it just in general? Like, I was trying to understand that in general. So, through the business office? I know I read them. I just, but you know what I mean? Like, as the law changes, I, I know. I didn't go through them. I just meant, like, from a, an eye would just make it. Because this was really thorough and it had. A lot of like the last one. Like yeah, the privacy information. I was just wondering, like, hmm. preliminarily, a business office, the county office also reviews it. Um, if it's difficult or they see policies they're not familiar with, they'll have their legal team review it. And then, in some cases, you go to an outside attorney to review or develop um, our contracts. That is, thank you. Thank you. That was okay. 
Motion, please. <laughs> so moved. Second. Carol, thank you. Any discussion? Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There is my vote. Uh, action item 15, approval agreement with the Art of Education University for online professional development in an amount not to exceed 7500 Dr. Nico. Thank you. So this recommendation comes from the Art Advisory. As a reminder, the Art Advisory reviewed, uh, identified two goals to review based on the Art and Education Plan that was developed from 2015 to 2020. But, but that Art arts and education, they only wrote goals for three years. So what this committee did was review two goal areas, made recommendations. One of those was for professional development. This was recommended to bring forward to continue to support our visual and teachers. Public comment? Any more questions? Um, sorry. Um, did you review it? Yes. Did you look at some things? Yes. It yes. It's oh, yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's Thank you. Motion please. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any more discussion? Um, do you have a bunch of teachers already interested in this? And so Bridget brought it forward and worked with some elementary teachers on the site a few years ago. So we have played around in the sandbox a bit with okay. it, but we'd like to bring it back for more teachers to have the opportunity to review. Okay. Thank you. Caitlin. Yes. Board members, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? There is my vote. Item 16, approval increase the existing agreement with Best Best Interior for legal counsel related to special education issues with a not to exceed amount of 30000 for the 2018-19 and 2019-20 school year. This is just doing this for I can do it again. So this is on behalf of Irene White Special Education to continue to support some of the students um, in particular cases. Public comment? Questions from the board? Motion? So then, second. Okay. Discussion? It actually seems like from Dr. Flores' answer that our overall visit from these are down here. Like, it's okay. It's okay. okay. I don't have a work in mind. Caitlin? Yes. Um, board, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries by vote. Action item 17 approval of career counseling coordinator job description. Thank you. So um, this job description um, is the first step um, in uh, creating this position that would uh, is a component of the Strong Workforce Program, which is a grant we just received that we received. Um, and so it provides uh, funding for this position. And so this job description was developed in conjunction with Orange County Department of Education as we would be sharing the um, individual hire position. Public comment? Board questions? The 150000 that includes the benefits position. That would cover the benefits for the position as well. Is, is this how the money needed to be spent on the person? It, it's a multifaceted yeah, multi grant. So um, the county identified several different areas for us to participate in. Uh, Dr. Mandary brought this back in. Uh, one of them was this mm -hmm. as a topic, so it was mm -hmm. specifically this job. So right. all those districts that applied for the grant with the county and applied for this segment of the grant all received the same amount of money mm -hmm. for well, each high school actually within their district receives this as a person at their school site um, that will be working directly for. So for example, if Irvine applied, uh, Northwood, Uni, uh, they would all have one of these. We only have the one school, so we, we got yeah. one. But if you didn't apply for that portion of the grant, you did not take the money for that, so you're not getting the position. So I believe, and Dr. Mayberry could correct me, but I believe the, the most districts that actually applied for the grant wanted this position for sure, because it helps coordinate the rest of the grant components of it as well. So. Well, it seems like a great position. Could you, so I could explain it to somebody in of the public that wait, asked. Wait, wait, wait. I have a question. Do you want more discussion? Do you need a question? Well, I wanted to ask another question. All right, is that all right? Yeah. Okay, my question is could you tell me what their day would look like? Not yet. Um, I think, you know, we have an understanding of what the job description is, but because this is a brand new grant from the county level, um, we're still going to work out the specifics as to what their day in and day out will look like. 
the intent is that they will spend you know, the majority of their time here in the district um, supporting a K-12 continuum. So working with the counselors at the uh, elementary, middle, and high, uh, as well as our, um, our transition coordinators and uh, our uh, folks in the College and Career Center identifying opportunities. So they will go out in the county and try to articulate. So we have some students that can go out and do mentor programs. It's really one of the big areas of focus out of this grant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it will evolve a little bit over time. Because this is because it's the first time out the gate that it's going to take some time to get everything up and running. Uh, but the intent is it's that you know the the belief is that this will be ongoing funding. So I can see it over the next several years kind of evolving into something that's once they get everything kind of in a row, then it will continue to have more site specific time. Uh, is really the, is my hope. So they'll be able to see kids and work with staff and, and do that sort of thing. So so, so it doesn't work with students directly at all. There will be some opportunity to interface directly with students, but to the degree in the beginning, I'm not sure to how much it will be right off the bat. Um, it's because they are going to be spending time getting all of the, um, the organization of the work done. So, like I said, I, I think we have to wade into it a little bit to see. It is grant funded, so um, if the grant goes away, the position will be eliminated. So, um, it's uh, because it's fully funded through the grant. Thank you. A second. Any discussion? And I, I, you know, I am, I'm a junior, and you know, have such a variety of things that you have to do. I, and having been ahead of years and up to venture back in the world, I said I had to pick up the phone and just call a bunch of organizations since they told us what they wanted, right? The our standards. And I said, hey, the moment I said I had a high schooler, they're like, oh no, we don't bring high schoolers. So then I. Have to be over here, so I tell him, Dr. Gloria, like, we need something. And he's like, oh, what do you see the position we're creating on them? That's perfect. It's perfect because they need to provide opportunities as well, right? And so we just, it's a state level thing. It's not just about my kids, it's about all kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so they said, even the one. I want to reference one of the great, I, in my actual job that I have, I'm working with Kathy Boyd and the Orange County Department of Ed, and so I'm really familiar with this. Not only will these career counselors be at school sites, but they will meet together to understand the county itself, the businesses, the jobs, the workforce, the pathways, so there'll be this great interconnectedness that we are missing now. That's, that's really yeah. helpful, so we're kind of isolated. Right, so but everybody, you can meet and find out what com internships are happening at Irvine or Anaheim, and, and that's, um, I happen to work within that specter, so I think it's really exciting. I think it is too, I just want to get a better feel for it. I think with the description, there's a lot in here that's helping students transition out of secondary school to post-secondary, mm -hmm. and I think that there will be I was still working with students, not just with staff members, but I believe that uh, the county is still, in my opinion, still catching up to the elimination of so many things with the kids who have any really counseling at all. They had storefront counseling, I mean, it was just, it's, but now it's really um, increasing to what, what I think students need. So I don't, and it is a grant, so. Yeah, they, they purposely made the job description a little flexible. Um, Dr. Mabry, kind of, uh, we discussed this in cabinet more recently, where um, the, the county wants to give us the flexibility to find the right person for that role. And uh, I, I appreciate that, that it's not a very narrow right. definition, but uh, it, it gives us a little flexibility as we go through the process. So. Well, also, it's going to be tough since every school is going to be looking for one. That's why I get out early, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to post it as soon as you As soon as the board approves it tomorrow morning, so first thing. Oh, okay. Any more discussion? Caitlin? Yes. Board members, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries by vote. Uh, action item 18 approval increase work year of transition services coordinator from 11 months per year to 12 months per year beginning with the 2019 20 school year. Thank you. So you may recall that this position a few years back was 12 months. Um, and then we had. Uh, <laughs> We thought we didn't need the person, you know, for that uh, extra month. Um, but in that time, some reporting requirements changed, mm -hmm. so we actually did add some things to the job description, um, and our grant funding has increased. So with that, we're um, proposing to increase uh, this position to 12 months, beginning with the next school year. Mm -hmm. 
public comment? Any board questions? Motion, please. Second. Second. Any board discussion? I appreciate that you always look at it. You took it away. Now we have a need, so you're bringing it back. Discussion. Caitlin. Yes. Board members. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Five zero. Our last uh, item: board member requests for items for future meetings, requests for information, or general comments. Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you. Kelly. I'm hoping that maybe we could take part of a meeting this summer to talk about. Um, futuristic ideas or ways that we can help our um, our students um, position themselves better, uh, that we can position the school district better. Uh, it seems like we're getting caught in weeds a lot of times, and uh, I think there's some really outstanding things that we are capable of doing that could uh, compensate for some of the misunderstandings that people have. Uh, and with enhance our students getting into different places. Yes, I have some ideas. Staff Laura and how we format that that kind of a discussion of goal setting or maybe something study session. Probably study session or something like that. I love that idea. Something for Kelly. And I was going to give a compliment to. Um, I went to the vocational lunch, and I know other staff members did, but this time I sat with community members, and I was so impressed with how hard they tried to get our students with special needs more skills. One of the women that's in charge of the thrift store was a former voc ed teacher at Dana Hills High School, so she's really familiar, and she'd look at each one and say, you know, I gave them this task and they got good at it right away, so I gave them another one. She's always thinking ahead. Now, this girl here, she can run the cash register. I can get her to do more. Dee, could you ask her if she could come in this summer and get even more skills? Which I did, but she's moving and she can. And then she'd look at someone else and say, I think he has really good organizational skills. I'm going to work on giving him more skills in that area. So we are just so blessed to have wonderful people in our community that are helping our students. Um, so I want to say I attended the high school pep rally on last Friday. It was a kick. Um, I brought my husband. It was really great. So I just want to celebrate how great that event was, celebrating students and how wonderful it was. I also attended the high school PTA meeting last week, and Dr. Ullman was there to answer questions about the bell schedule, and I thought it was really direct and candid, and it clarified a lot, so I appreciate that. Uh, and finally, I just want to restate my support for posting all our public records online. I think it will help with reducing some of the workload. Mm -hmm. um, and I also still continue to hope that all board members do all district business on the district email accounts, because that is part of our bylaws, um, because I think it's really important that we are transparent and we do meet those public records requests um, openly and really faithfully. And then I agree with Peggy, I wasn't that wrong, but the other, the other parts of what we need is board members, uh, our obligations to transparency by working through the, um, working through our board district email. Um, as well as I agree with Jen, like I think that's a great idea to have a futuristic type meeting or a 30,000 foot level meeting. Um, and then I'd like to add to that that before our next organizational meeting, we look at the difference between regular meetings and other meetings we can have and so we can create a uh, maybe a more robust or futuristic schedule to our, our meetings as well, where we can involve the public and not feeling so isolated, right, in certain discussions. Um, because the Brown Act precludes us from being able to have a discussion. Um, also, I want to make it really clear we do not comment on personnel issues in the open session. Um, and so not that we did here, but I just want to make a comment. So I'm sorry about that. And thank you to all of the negotiation team for all of your hard work and for such, I'm looking for a longer hand, for being so positive and such a cheerleader and, and, and figure out what your constituents need and really working to do what's best for them. And it's, I, I love hearing about the work you do. It warms my heart. It really. And at least I don't know how you do it, you do. 
And I agree about putting everything on blind so you can do less of that area more. Right, and share it because you are you're always going. And, and I know it's negotiation time, so it seems overwhelming, but and everybody has their period of time. It's busiest, right? But, but thank you for everything you're doing. So, and thank you guys for the negotiation team. Okay. I also was in high school with David, and I, I really do want to compliment Dr. Allman on the thoroughness of the presentation he did on the bail block schedule change. I think that it provided a lot of information and made me think almost like Denise Pope go out and tell 10 other people from the parents that were there that heard it because it is, there are complexities to it, and I think that's um, um, some of what Dr. Kelly referenced. There are a lot of requirements in education that you know, just like in any field that you're not involved in, you don't know about. And uh, with different minute requirements and day requirements and what's in the law and what's not in the law. And it's, uh, so it's not, it's certainly not done on a, on a whim. It's done with a lot of background. And again, I think people need to understand what's a site level task, decision, work, and what the board does at, at the level that we are. And we're, we're not at that level. Um, they, Although I got there late from Margaret's CSEA gathering, but that uh, she really puts a lot of effort into that and in always um, recognizing the classified workers and making them feel as important as we know they are. And I appreciate that you spend the effort doing that. Uh, I went to Thurston's um, open house and it was all it's always terrific. And I think that uh, it's always good to keep in mind when we have concerns like this that we have that come up periodically from time to time, whatever, whether it's the baseball field or the weighted classes, whatever, whatever sparks an outburst out from the community, from certain members that are most affected. I think it's really good that we get to the school open houses and see what's going on in the classrooms, the enthusiasm of our teaching staff and our support staff, and that we have a parent community that really interacts with each other, their children know each other. We are, that's a fortunate, fortunate part of being small. Our students, a lot of them go through a school from preschool all the way until they graduate. And I think it's, it really makes me reflect on, um, we don't need to get so caught up in what we do or try to do that doesn't match everyone's expectations, but then what we do on the regular level. And that we have, because we have a whole range of students. And I am confident that we're meeting the needs of those at the top and those at the bottom. I'm, I, I don't, that concerns me to hear that expressed because I don't, I don't believe that. Uh, and in reference to what Member Curry said about the lunch that Mindy has her students put on for their parents and other members, we have had tremendous support from the Assistance League for a lot of years. Uh, they are very supportive of children in general from that IRP program they run for the ones that are under one year old and, and serves the greater uh, Orange County. Then with our students that come down and since we no longer have home ec or kitchen at the high school, <laughs> that once we lost that we need another place to go and they are very supportive. And I know that Rita from the library, when they started asking Rita to come, she was delighted that their support of students was recognized. And I don't know what it was that one year we had kids in the workability program come in with their sponsors at some of the restaurants in town and they introduced them and introduced the person that was helping them learn the job skills. So it's, um, it's really good to, to, to recognize that. And I think that was all the notes that I had. I can I get back sure on the end? Sorry, uh, because you may comment last time on the challenge just on the, on the cheat, you know, just mm -hmm. how high it is. And, mm -hmm. um, and I just found it was worth I thought you were about to say it again. <laughs> I thought you were right now. But I think it's really important that um, we're letting teachers know and we're working within a structure like Challenge Success to help no matter what parents say about, you know, I want to be brave, because they of all the fears we all have, uh, that we're not saying it's more important than learning and mastery information. So we would create cheating. So it's that gene number of training. It was, and I guess I did add one more thing, which actually I did just out of curiosity today. I was looking at the last three years of the of the end of the year student newspaper edition where our kids are going to school, and Victoria often put it together. It was really interesting because it's heavy in California, and it's also pretty heavy on the community colleges. 
And when you add in being counties out of Orange County. So it's just, it was interesting to see that. And um, I, I just don't, I don't see the limitation. I see that there's uh, about 70 students each year that go out of state. And some go internationally and some, it's a, it's a real variety. So just, uh, it's good that we get that information. It would be interesting to know how many that could go to the community colleges transferring into a UC. Yes. Because in the original Brown Act, the first, first admissions to a UC goes to someone who graduates from a community college. And I think that's missed sometimes in the discussion. It is. It is. And, uh, motion to adjourn. And our next regular meeting is Tuesday.